we have no choice but to look at Kevin Durant differently, along with Devin Booker and, and, and Bradley Bill. Miami Heat may have created the super team model with LeBron James, D. Wade, and Chris Bosh, but the Phoenix Suns may have killed it. Yes, the super team model. People have been talking about this since the Suns got swept, and they said, look, it's over. You can't build a super team anymore. Just look at what the Suns did this year. I mean, you getting swept by the Timberwolves when your expectations were to at least make it past the first round. It's just not a good look. As a trio, you are minus 51 when you're on the floor. That's the worst out of any trio in the postseason so far. <laughs> we also look at a lighter version of a super team in the Clippers. They tried doing the big free with James Harden and and they all got outplayed by Luke and Kyrie. Kawhi couldn't even play the last four games of the series. This was just a beatdown, really. And so even with the Clippers, you're looking at this and saying, yeah, I don't know if you should have done this. I don't know if trading for Harden was going to make things much easier for you, considering how he plays in elimination games. Kawhi Leonard being unhealthy when, you know, he needs to be healthy. That's not a good sign either. So the Clippers really, that's not really what we're focusing on here as much as this Suns team that was healthy, fully healthy in the playoff series that they play against the Timberwolves. A lot of people had the Suns winning that series simply because of how much more potent those three that you're seeing on your screen were K KD, Booker, and Beal. That's got to get you at least one series win, right? For that reason, many people are saying the super team model is over. It's done. There's no point in building a super team anymore. But first, in order to understand whether or not a super team is really the model that should be or should not be built in this day and age, we're going to look at past super teams, notably the one that really started this mantle, the Miami Heat Big Free, the Heatles, right? That team was prolific. You know, if I go and look up what a super team is and, you know, I try to see what definition is. Google has a bunch of search results that it gives me. Well, here you got Urban Dictionary. I'm not going to show you the whole page. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that risky. It says here it usually requires two or more players to join in to form a free all-star player super team. Okay, interesting definition. Another guy on Reddit has here that a super team is a starting five consisting of three or more players who are in the top five of their position. Interesting. Yeah. Now, this is one thing that was funny is when I looked this up, apparently LeBron said in 2017 that he had never played for a super team. I'm not going to lie. That is funny because even the wiki scenery, <laughs> that's a weird word to say, says here in basketball, the term is especially used to refer to the 2010s Miami Heat, Cavaliers, and Golden State Warriors, the first two of which featured LeBron James. LeBron, you're not safe from this one. You've played in two super teams this decade. And obviously this big free was a big free that got jumbled up in 2010 and during free agency when Chris Bosh and LeBron decided to go to Miami they ended up losing in the finals this was an upset win by the Dallas Mavericks and obviously the two the super team just couldn't get it done and notably LeBron James really struggled in this series in 2011 and one thing I really want to highlight is not just LeBron and the big free struggling but it's also just them not being able to put it all together in their first year right we have to think about this right when you look at the Suns losing in the first round right obviously their expectation was to go further but it's not common for a team that is formed within the first year to win a championship it's not that common it's not common right and really those circumstances should not blind us into thinking that oh the Phoenix Suns you know oh they're done because of this one year but at the same same time though the writing is on the wall for this team right phoenix and i could look at a milwaukee team and a clippers team that were unhealthy and you could say run it back run it back right those guys can run it back but this phoenix suns was really built top heavy for a reason because they rely so much on those guys to obviously bring them home and win the games and for the fact that they weren't healthy and they weren't able to win those games is really what speaks to this model's biggest flaw which is depth obviously lack of depth no depth we'll get back to that subject later in the video but again, this big free of LeBron, D. Wade, and Chris Bosh, uh, they would still be able to win a couple championships, right? And effectively, their Eastern Conference run to the finals for, for those four years essentially closed the windows for many of these teams that we've seen in the early 2010s in the East. Notably, you have that Bulls team that played in the 2011 Conference Finals where you could see the Heat here losing by 12 points, right? And this is the fourth quarter with three minutes to go in the game. But they managed to come back and win the series in five. I mean, look at Joe Kim Noah's face. It says it all. I think a lot of people, they look at Derrick Rose's career and think, what if he didn't get hurt? Well, I don't have to look that far out to say, well, what if the Miami Heat super team didn't exist? What if LeBron stayed in Cleveland or, or at the very least went to a team and didn't try to form a super team? What if D. Rose was able to make it out of the East with his Bulls in 2011? The same year he won the MVP, his legacy would be completely different. People would look at him in a completely different way. He'd be in the finals. He might have won the championship. And who remembers this series with Paul George hitting one of the craziest shots 
a conference final series that was just so electric, but the Miami Heat came on top, obviously, and seven games too. What if Paul George in 2012, 2013, what if he bested the Miami Heat in the conference finals that year? What if he actually made it to the finals? Like these super teams have really changed the landscape of a lot of players' careers, man. If Paul George had made the finals early on in his career, it, it, his legacy would look completely different as well. Carmelo Anthony, he played in 2014 against the Heat in the playoffs and lost in the second round. But what if he went against Paul George and the Pacers in conference finals and they beat the Pacers? What if that could have happened? Who knows if Carmelo made the finals or at the very at least made the conference finals <laughs> his legacy would look completely different as well and basically these super teams really the, the the thing with them is they make it so that so many of these eastern conference teams that are looking to win and contend basically their windows become shut because of how much more dominant those super teams are that's really one thing that people hated so much about these teams they became the villains of the nba we did have some great moments with lebron james in game six and seven against the celtics again another team whose window basically ended when the Miami Heat team formed, right? This team was just so unstoppable in the Eastern Conference. And those two championships would show for it, right? And those four finals berth, right? They won the East four straight years. That's dominance right there. Now, if you look at the Mind the Game pod that, you know, recently got recorded, where they talked about how Eric Spoelstra went to Chip Kelly in Oregon, and they talked about, oh, the, the, the spread offense, you know? Oh, this is how we played in the football. And then basically, Spoelstra basically put that in and implemented it into the Miami Heat system to where Chris Bosh basically was placed at the, at the five. Okay, they, I think they had Joel Anthony play the five at that point. You know, Haslam was there. Chris Bosh was the five now. And he would basically spread the offense to where his spacing would be key. His corner freeze would be key for this spread out offense to work. Basically, the five out before it was called the five out. Health did play a factor later on in their, you know, dynastic run. Yeah, D-Wade's knees were basically cooked. So even this super team was not immune to health's concerns, right? This guy's knees were cooked. Even in 2013, when they played seven games against the Spurs in the finals 2014 he was even worse and LeBron basically had to try to carry this team uh because D-Wade was just he was just not the same player he used to be right and then funny enough after the Heatles run LeBron goes back to Cleveland he's coming home folks and then you have the Kevin Love trade right the Cavs you know coincidentally had the number one pick yet again for the third time in four years and they traded that pick to form this big free in LeBron, Kate, Kevin Love this time, and Kyrie Irving being the point guard. And this big free obviously, would make it to the finals not once, not just twice, not two, not three, but four straight years, right? Four straight years, with obviously Kyrie not being there the last year they made the finals, right? But just seeing how the East shaped out in, the, in those eight years with LeBron being in Miami and Cleveland, Miami Heat win the East, Miami Heat once again win the East, Miami Heat once again win the East, Miami Heat once, once again win the East. LeBron goes to Cleveland, and once again they win the East. Once again, they win the East, and then the, the following year, they win the East, and yet again, they win the East, right? And it, it's quite interesting seeing the, 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 the cycles, right? LeBron James super teams, the, the, the dominance that they had, right? Some people are more hesitant to call the Cavaliers a super team, mainly because their defense was not par, not just that, but Kevin Love as the third option. I think a lot of people are dismayed by that. Uh, as a person that is championing prime Kevin Love as a very underrated player, uh, I will say people just do not understand how good that guy is. Okay, I'm gonna just say it right now, y'all have no idea how good Kevin Love was, bro. You, you people, you gaslighters, you gaslight us into thinking Kevin Love was not that good in his prime. Yo, this is why I hate some of you on NBA Twitter, man. It pisses me off. You have no idea how good this guy was. All right, back to the video. Okay, I just want to put that out there that y'all have no idea. Go watch some tape. Go see some highlights. This guy was a monster. But again, this dude had to play a different role. Obviously, being the third option, he had to spread the floor, and he obviously had to make it so that this team would be able to work defensively he's not as good as chris bosh is so obviously people are gonna take that away from him guys this too was prolific in its prime and it's just sad that people now are just oh i hate it here but lebron and the Cavs, that 2018 one especially man as a raptors fan this was not supposed to happen i i hate it here bro this shit pisses me off bro do you have any idea how pissed i was this game where the rosen sat for basically the whole fourth quarter because he was being ah and then we come back down like what 16 18 i don't remember and we tie the game with og shooting a free pointer and then this 
fucking BS happen. I fucking hate it here, bro. LeBron, Raymond, James Sr. I want nothing good to come from your career anymore because I because I want you to pay for all these all these years of torture, right? You tortured us for years. I want you to I want you to lose every every first round you play and look moving forward, bro. You piss me off, dude. You look at my Shunokum's big booty Larry, bro. I'm just sad for him, bro. But hey, we get we got it done in 2019. What can I say? <laughs> but speaking of 2019 and 2018, I mean LeBron couldn't get it done against the Warriors in the finals and that's because the Warriors were also a huge huge super team this team that got assembled obviously um in 2017 with kevin durant now being the latest addition what this dude did to the league for those three years he was at the warriors bro it's so disgusting i, I swear to god it's so gross his championship winning ways those two chips I, I, a lot of people still look at them in a very very bad fashion because he had to team up with a team that <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna I'm, I want to reiterate this to people that just don't know or are not familiar with the sport this team won a championship in 2015 okay they were already champions at that point and then they would go on to win 73 games in 2016 the the best record in NBA history in 2017 the first year KD joined them just look at their record in the playoffs 4-0 sweep 4-0 sweep 4-0 sweep swept the entire west 4-1 only lost one game and that was due to a supernatural performance from the Cavaliers in game four basically a performance that I just that really was all they had left and that, obviously they lost game five at home right and, and um the Clippers, the Lob City Clippers. I know injuries also derailed their um, their whole contention, but the war is basically being assembled. The, the super team basically just you know they, it just ended their title window. You know, look in the West, man. There was a lot of players that were affected by the Warriors super teams, right? It's not just the players in the East, right? Oh boy, Chris Paul, the Clippers. It looked like in 2015 that was the year. It really did. And obviously the Warriors that year were the ones that won the whole thing. That was before they even formed the super team. And then later on, injuries obviously you know bit them in the ass but at the same time they could have had one western conference champion right they could have been the western conference champion in one of those years maybe dame dollar what if he ended up winning the west with his blazers team i know people say oh they were never good enough to win it or oh, kd said it himself look they, they may have won the west if the Warriors super team wasn't a thing let's be honest let's let, let's really be honest here i don't know if people remember yusuf nurkic i'm pretty sure he tore his acl or no he broke his leg in, in, in a gruesome fashion in 2019 so really they were playing that conference finals without their center and it was it was obviously a sweep but it was a very close sweep it was a, one of those series that the portland trailblazers led for like the majority the vast majority of the series and they just ended up losing in the clutch every game i know harden he was so close and a lot of people will say he choked in that game seven well a lot of people would also say he got fouled twice in that game seven and they didn't call it right a lot of people say things is my point okay james harden what if he did go to the finals because well look, look kd's on that team so the rockets might have beaten that warriors team without kd so what if he made the finals and ended up beating the lebron james Cavs. that was you know a weaker version of themselves in 2018 harden would be a champion and it would look very different his legacy would look very different so I'm, I'm just saying they were so close they were the closest one they almost knocked them out in 2018 but they just couldn't get it done it's, it's tough chris paul obviously getting hurt as well you ha luck has to play a factor in these series as i get it but again these super teams have taken these players legacies and has drastically shaped it into what it is today it's really sad but at the same time, obviously, they're just trying to win just like everybody else, right? That was hot. <laughs> I don't know if I was yeah. more mad than when you like, went to go. I think I was more mad. Why are you mad did. about this stuff? Bro, I'm in the league. What do you mean? Why am I mad about this I mean, stuff? Like, I'm in the Western Conference. I got to play you MFers all the time anyway as it is. Over and over again. We done got eliminated by y'all a few times in the first round. So I'm I mean, looking so at you cuz. I mean, you know you're, you you know you guys aren't going to win a championship. Bro, we have the, the team. <laughs> <laughs> we have the capability. And this is how a lot of NBA fans felt, obviously. CJ McCollum just was courageous enough to voice them. On Twitter, he even blasted Kevin Durant after the pod, which Kevin Durant replied. He said, I just did your effing podcast. Snakes in the grass, boy, I tell you. Interesting banter there. But honestly, these, th this super team was really the worst one. This Warriors super team, they closed the window of so many teams that could have won the West, right? It's tough. There's a reason why so many people were rooting for the Raptors in 2019, because they were just so damn annoying. We did not want to see the Warriors win again, right? Even the most casual person would tell you, oh, I want to see the Raptors win, because the Warriors were just so damn annoying, so damn OP. Stephen A. Smith now. Steve, what was your reaction when you heard about not only Kawhi Leonard heading to the Clippers, but also the trade involving Paul George? 
Well, uh, you know, stunned, stunned to say the least. Uh, the Warriors changed the landscape of the NBA so much so that teams had to respond in kind. The Clippers forming their team with, you know, Kawhi and Paul George. The Lakers forming their team with AD and LeBron. This was a clash of titans in L.A. But there could only be one champion, and it was the Lakers that year, right? They ended up winning in the bubble. And the Clippers, you know, they couldn't make it to the conference finals to face the eventual champion Lakers. And then in 2021, you had the failed super team in Brooklyn. That one was really due to injuries, right? We could all chalk it up to injuries. We, so, we could also chalk it up to the, the nonsense that happened with Kyrie, the drama that happened with all those players involved. This Nets team was really destined to fail because of all the bullshit that happened around and the injuries. And it's sad to say because they had a legit chance to win it all, right? I made a documentary, you know, talking all about it. Two weeks ago, you guys can check that out if you haven't seen it. They only played 16 games together. That's really like the biggest in the indictment on their team the fact that they couldn't even muster up half a season together right they couldn't even muster up a fourth a quarter of the season only 16 games to show for it and by the way that includes the playoffs so <laughs> they're they were cooked from the beginning bro they were cooked with injuries and kd you know he, he goes to phoenix and I, my ish is like yo let me form another super team here man what a disaster class this team was a disaster class right a lot of a lot of teams I, I guess they don't understand why the Warriors super team worked so well right curry at the time was being underpaid right he had taken a contract that was basically making it easier for the warriors general manager to take in a lot of talent like kd let's set the record straight on this team because they're doomed they're doomed 2024 2025 look at the contracts that are being given out to the big free 51 million to kevin durant 50 million to beal and 49 million to devin booker these are terrible these are terrible contracts to give right terrible this is terrible you're paying free players 150 million dollars like i don't think you understand how crazy that is especially in this new cba i'll get into that right now because this is another reason why the era of super teams might be over so last year in june the cba basically got renewed and there was a whole new agreement written up that was basically renewed for seven years and in this CBA, there was some things added that would make the construction of super teams quite difficult. So they added another apron to the luxury tax, right? There's the first apron now, which is like the normal luxury tax, but then they added a second apron. So teams that basically are paying over the second apron maximum, which is 189 mil that is set for next season. Well, they would face some interesting penalties, okay? Some interesting restrictions would be faced on them. The Suns paying over $17 million over the second apron which is pretty massive so i got this handy dandy pdf that's basically summarizing the cba right and the key points and i want to get into some points that i think you know is quite important for especially the suns if the suns want to acquire a player through the mle well a team that is basically over the second apron will not be able to use the taxpayer mid-level exception to acquire players so you won't be able to acquire a player from the mle you're cooked i mean you're not cooked but you know that's just one less avenue for you to go to all right let's look at draft picks now if by the next season right you are exceeding the second apron your first round pick seven years out will be basically frozen you will be frozen meaning the pick cannot be traded you cannot trade that pick seven years out i know matt ishbia he likes to trade picks he said it recently and i covered it in the video on this channel he likes to trade picks well he's gonna be doomed when he realizes that because he's paying so much money to this super team that is really not a good super team at all he won't be able to trade those picks that he wants to trade <laughs> so don't be frozen not be able to be used not just that but if there's a little caveat here if a team's salary exceeds the second apron in at least two of the next four salary cap years the frozen pick will be moved to the bottom of the first round the end of first round pick so basically that pick will become a 30th pick unless another team has a frozen pick that's moved to the bottom you're going to be the one that has a 30th pick that is basically untradeable so you have an untradeable lay first and that's that's not good you would have to be uh, in the clear for free of the next four seasons in order for your frozen pick to move back up and let me tell you something phoenix i don't know if you want your picks to be frozen because you don't got many picks left to even trade to begin with and let's be honest for a second what's the ceiling for a team that is sixth place right getting swept by a tim wolf's team that is much better than them what is their ceiling what is the ceiling of this phoenix suns team that is obviously basically paying free players upwards of 150 million dollars a year what is their ceiling i, I just want to know what the ceil what the ceiling is of this team right the ceiling is really a first round exit i feel like i don't think they can even win a series unless they get lucky and match up against a team that they can take advantage of but <laughs> 
seeing how the West keeps getting better, I feel like Phoenix, with the restrictions that will be put on them to acquire players through free agency and acquire players, you know, through draft, they're gonna be they're gonna be left behind, right? And these players that they got are just getting older. Kevin Durant, injury prone. Booker, same thing. Beal, same thing. These guys are just getting older, and they're gonna get more injuries as the time passes by. Especially Beal. Oh boy, Beal looks nothing like the player that's being paid fifty million dollars a year. And I think his last year in his contract, he's being paid sixty one million. Yikes, that is not good. And he has a no trade clause, so you can't trade him until unless he says he wants to be traded. And I I don't know if he wants to be traded yet. I don't know. Maybe he wants to run it back one more year. <laughs> in that case, you're stuck with him, okay? Because I'm not sure what else he could do as a, as a Suns team. Does this mean that there's no use for building a super team in this climate? Is that what this means? Well, I would say both yes and no. And let me elaborate more into this, okay? So obviously, a super team that is relying on stupid star players that are getting older, that are in their mid-30s, and not just that, acquiring players that are injury prone, but are getting paid, you know, loaded contracts that are basically, you know, some of the worst contracts in the NBA. That's not a way to build a super team. That's not the right way to do it, right? Getting players that are much younger and much more healthy, not just that, building through the draft, acquiring pieces through your developmental leagues that you're playing, right? The G League, the, D, the G League that you got, developing players. Having depth on your team matters too. I, I want to point to one team that I think, you know, is doing a way better job of, you know, getting close to a super team. So this team is one of the youngest teams in the league, but they're number one seed in the Western Conference. This team has some very, very good players. So the season they played this year, right? Shea was 25 when the season started. Jalen Williams, I think 22, Shea 21. These are young players and these are your budding stars. Shea, an MVP candidate. And if you look at the contract situation, it's quite interesting. Shea is basically being paid a max contract and he's going to be on the contract uh, for what looks to be a very, very underrated contract. Okay, this is a very interesting contract. Considering guys that are being paid 50 mil, he's outperforming these guys by a long shot, right? And obviously the rookie, technically, Chet Holmgren, I mean, his contract is now, it's, it's looking quite interesting, right? Jalen Williams, his contract is pretty interesting as well. Look, these guys are going to be up for an extension, but that's not going to be until 2026 at the very least, right? The OKC Thunder, they're deep, which matters. Their players are younger and healthier, not just that, uh, they're better. <laughs> Let's just say that they're better than the Bradley Beal. They're better than the Devin Booker. They're better than Kevin Durant. Okay, you know what? Chad is not better than KD. Let's 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 chill. Let's chill. Let's chill. <laughs> let me not do that yet. But uh, let's just say age is on their side, and not just that. OKC, I think they don't need to do much uh, for this team to be better. Really, the way to build a super team, the best way to do it is the way Sam Presti is doing in OKC. Right? We won't call it a super team, but in a few years, it might. We might as well say it's a super team because of how great the top three players are not just that in 2026 they're going to be up for extensions and at that point we will see how this team shapes up to be right if you want to maximize your team and get one more piece to maximize their chances at winning championship they traded for gobert and obviously they gave up a lot to get gobert they're obviously paying cat a huge contract as well that is obviously going to also be given to ant when he is up for extension which by the way he's up for a potentially 260 million dollar super max extension they're deep as well they're deep as well and they look good they look very good for the future i hate to even do this bro because the Knicks, it's funny, the Knicks have actually done a way better job at even approaching the model of a super team, even though they really are underpaying a lot of their guys, right? Right now, people are saying that, oh, Jalen Brunson's being underpaid. When back then, people were saying the contract he got was too much, right? He was being overpaid. For the 2023-24 season, these are the teams that rank top 10 uh, in basically contract and cash salary paid to their team players. Warriors number one, they're out. They didn't make the playoffs. Clippers number two, they're out. Phoenix number three, they're, they're out. Milwaukee number four, they're out. Five, Denver's still in. Boston's still in. Miami's out. Philly's out. New Orleans out. Lakers out. Where are the Knicks? The Knicks aren't even top 10. Where's the Knicks? They're like, they're number 18. That's crazy. OKC number 20. This is what I mean, bro. This is what I mean. They're getting, they're getting closer to building the model. Minnesota? I didn't even see them. They're at number 15. But obviously, some of that money kicks in next year for Minnesota to where, look, they're number four now. <laughs> So obviously the money is going to kick in and they're going to have to really, you know, face the reckoning of their financial, you know, implications and the reckoning of their financial decisions, right? And if you look at the Knicks, they're still bottom. Okay, see, look at how much lower they are. And obviously that's not factoring in the contracts that are going to be 
obviously extended or signed during during the off season. But it's just looking at next season, you know, before this off season starts, right? Okay, see, they don't have not a lot of cash being given to to many players yet. So it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to look at. But I think the Knicks and the Thunder and obviously the Timberwolves, they're, they're pretty. They're 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 in a position where they could build for the future. Not just that, but even potentially have a super team on their hands, especially the Knicks and the Thunder, right? The Timberwolves right now, they basically traded up to get a gold Barrett. Minnesota's future is looking more, more bright. Knicks and Thunder future even brighter. And look, this is the way to build a super team. The way these teams are doing it, that's the way to do it. The way a Suns team or a Clippers team, that's not the way to do it anymore. You don't do it like that anymore. You need depth. You need guys that are, that are obviously more reliable health-wise to be on your super team, right? That's what you need. So is the super team era dead? I would say yes in the sense that teams are not going to go and trade the whole you know cow farm for a player anymore they're not going to do that but in the sense no it's not dead because well we saw gobert get traded but again that team is always going to have to face that financial implication later on down the years and next year minnesota is, is he's they got a lot of money paid to a lot of players maybe minnesota does face a reckoning sooner than later but the knicks and the thunder look at how they built their teams and how they put themselves in a position to where if Embiid wants to leave, if a star player says, I want to get traded, they could basically trade some of their pieces for that player and basically have a super team in their hands, right? That's basically where these teams have put themselves in. So the way to build a super team is the way the Knicks and the Thunder have. Uh, put yourself in a position where when a star player is disgruntled, come in and acquire pieces. People look too much at acquiring the star players, but they don't look enough at how to set the pieces in place for that star player to be in the position to where when he gets traded to that team, he's still in a great team. And they're still in a great spot to win a championship. You might think to yourself, oh, well, the Suns did that. They traded for Kevin Durant, right? The Clippers did that, right? They traded Harden, right? They traded Harden. The problem is these players that they traded, first off, they traded a lot of their depth to get Kevin Durant. They traded a lot of their picks that they, that ha now they don't have any picks. Right. Look at the Clippers. Same thing. They traded a lot of their depth to try to get James Harden and they don't have as much picks either. The OKC Thunder, though, they can trade a lot of their picks and still have a lot more picks left. Right. And they could trade some of their players and still have a lot of more depth left. That's the thing. They're building on even more depth and even more picks. The Knicks traded for OG and Anobi. They didn't even have to trade a first round pick for him. They traded a second round pick that was basically a late first. If you look at the Pistons record. But the Knicks, just like the Thunder, have a lot of picks coming up. Right. They have so many picks. So many picks over the next couple of years that they could use to trade for a star. And Julius Randle's big contract, they could use that to trade for a star either. They can, bro, this next team, especially this next team, I don't think people understand. They're in prime position to trade for an Embiid or a, I don't think Giannis will leave. But a Giannis, if he says, oh, I want to leave, they're in prime position to get him. They're in prime position to form that super team. OKC also, same thing. Those two teams, I, you got to look out for them. You really do. So I don't think the Super Team era will, ne will ever be dead, technically, right? I don't think it'll ever be dead. But I just think the way the Suns and the Clippers have built it, I think that's going to be dead, right? Teams are not going to be as careless when trading pieces anymore. They're going to be more proactive in the draft, and they're going to try to develop their players more. The teams that do that are going to be the ones that are, that are going to win in the future. Not the ones like the Phoenix Suns and Clippers. Yeah, that's about it, man. Have a great one. Peace out.